Hello and welcome to Reporters. In this edition, we head to Sudan, a country which has been in the headlines of late amid mass protests and the demise of an ageing authoritarian leader. Wanted by the International Criminal Court, 75-year-old Omar al-Bashir presided over three decades, blighted by deadly conflict. Well, now he's behind bars in Khartoum, ousted by the army on April the 11th, on the back of a wave of demonstrations that evoke memories of the Arab Spring. His departure was met with jubilation in the streets, but with the military council now in charge, the protesters are keeping up the pressure. I'm joined now from the Sudanese capital by our correspondent, Julia Steers. Julia, uh, covering these protests, particularly at the early stage, not easy. No, certainly it's, Sudan has never been an easy place for foreign journalists to come, nor for Sudanese journalists to operate. But we've really seen that change in the few weeks since Bashir fell. It was quite easy to get a visa. And in the last few weeks, while we've been stopped a few times by members of the armed forces asking for our accreditation, we've had no real issues and certainly have been incredibly welcomed by the protesters who are eager to welcome international press, press and show the international community what's going on here. Thanks, Julia. And we can now watch Julia Steer's report from Sudan. On this night, tens of thousands of protesters gathered in front of the military headquarters in Khartoum. Their cell phones held up as torches of tribute in memory of fellow protesters killed during the uprising. They're waiting to hear from the Sudanese Professionals Association, one of the organizations leading the resistance. We first triumphed when President al-Bashir fell. That was our main demand, that he stepped down. But the road is still long because we have many grievances. We want a democratic country where justice and peace reign. Demonstrations must continue until everything we demand has been granted. Our protests show the diversity of Sudanese culture, but above all, our unity and our power. It's a distinctly peaceful movement, but they're brandishing the gallows as a symbol. Those who propped up al-Bashir's government for three decades must pay. Thousands of Sudanese have convened here since April 6, demanding the end of a dictatorial regime and the departure of the military officials leading the Transitional Council. On this night, Amjad organized a debate in one of the tents set up in the middle of the sit-in. How's it going? What do you guys think about the situation? About what's happened during the negotiations? Their faces show signs of fatigue after weeks of around-the-clock mobilization in blazing heat and through long nights. But their motivation persists. The mission of the army is to protect the country, not to lead it. The military should be represented by just one person at the negotiations. The Sudanese Professionals Association is a political organization of engineers, lawyers, journalists and doctors fighting for a democratic transition. We want them to respond to what we asked for in our Declaration for Freedom and Change and to assure us that the new government will be completely civilian. The first step is to transfer power to a technocratic government. And then we will start building the country brick by brick. Every night, there remain thousands of people holding court outside the military headquarters. A few months ago, it would have been unthinkable to walk here openly expressing anti-regime views. Amjad was once arrested simply for protesting. I was getting out of my car, walking into an office when members of these security forces approached me and threw me into their car. I tried to understand what was happening. They just told me that they were taking me with them. That's how they arrested me. 
There were around 2,000 prisoners, and in the cells of the prison, we all sang the slogan, Liberty, Peace and Justice, this is the people's revolution. His stint in prison gave rise to a stronger desire to fight the regime in a more organized way. He joined the Professionals Association just a few steps away from here. Amjad is one of many behind the organization's work. Unlike al-Bashir's regime, there's no hierarchy here. All members are basically equal, except for when it comes to the meetings to decide the fate of the country. We don't really take part, but we are kept informed. We know almost everything that happens during the negotiations, such as what the problems are. While protesters spend the night in the streets, safeguarding their country's future, others are up at dawn to keep them well fed. It's because of this bread that Sudan first erupted. Yet another surge in prices sparked unrest last December. Anas has been a baker since he was a teenager, a job that holds a special place in Sudanese culture. It's my work, it's what I do to make a living, and I love my job. All Sudanese rely on bread to live, because it's a simple meal, it's inexpensive, and that's why people want it all the time. Every day, hundreds of clients stream into his shop, despite the rising prices. In 2013 and 2014, with one Sudanese pound, I could have four loaves. In 2015, for one pound, it was three loaves. And in 2018, it's one pound for one loaf. The situation is terrible. If the people take to the streets, it's a big problem for the economy. We went out to demonstrate to express our anger. Here, the economic situation is really bad. Anas doesn't make money off rising bread prices. He claims the increase just covers the cost of flour. The price of flour is linked to the exchange rates between the pound and the dollar. If the value of the pound goes down, then prices rise. If you had come 15 days before the fall of Bashir, you would not have found so many bags here. We managed to get them as soon as he was not in power anymore. When it comes to flour, the state blocked distribution and rationed bakers. But now, Anas has enough, so he's decided to help the protesters. His most recent batch will go to them. Since the beginning of the sit-in, bakers have backed the revolution. There are many like Anas who support those demonstrating day in and day out. We want to thank all those who participate in these demonstrations. They are the heroes of Sudan, just like the martyrs. They are the spirit of this revolution. The crowd rushes around him to get their bread. We support their effort. We bring our bread here for free, not just once or twice, but very often. Good quality bread in large quantities. <laughs> The bread that's distributed to the crowd is much more than just food. It's now become a symbol of al-Bashir's demise. A student from the city of Atabara had falafels but no bread to make a sandwich. He started yelling, this revolution is one of bread. Far from the boisterous demonstrations, at Khartoum's Royal Care International Hospital, Salma operates on a patient. So we're doing a thyroidectomy for a patient with a multinodular goiter pressure symptoms. Uh, with pressure symptoms. So trachea the trachea is a bit deviated to the right. So that's why we're being a bit careful with it. OK, perfect. We'll go and see him now. After the operation, the surgeon visits several of her patients, many of whom are protesters. Her hospital treated several hundred in early April, when security services opened fire on them. Okay, good. This man was shot in the thigh as he spoke to a crowd. 
I touched my leg and it was all bloody. I collapsed and they took me to the clinic at the side of the sit-in and gave me first aid. When the sun rose, they transferred me here. I expected uh, like a lot of a lot of injured people, but emotionally, I think I was a bit uh, overwhelmed. It was it was a lot of things happening so fast. I know we had the training and everything, but still, you will never prepare it for that moment. When her shift ends, Salma has lunch with a colleague. Quickly, they're both glued to their phones, an indispensable portal for updates on the revolution. Salma uses Minbar Chat, a women's only Facebook group. This group was mainly about gossips for girls, but when the revolution happened, they kind of used it to send a message to get to the heads or figures of the old regime. The young women in the group distribute the names and photos of security agents in order to prevent the arrests of protesters. The one that's been hiding among us, who, um, who you think is your neighbor or your friend and you don't actually know what he's, he does for a living, and then they show you your, their history, their work papers, everything, and they put a picture next to it and they'd be like, take care, he, is, he works with the security forces. In the afternoon, both of them head out for the demonstration. They bring medicine and donations from the hospital to the sit-in first aid centers. They're walking by the building where snipers perched as they shot at Salma's patients. They were members of the security forces who remained loyal to al-Bashir. There was a lot of action used to happen here. But the army was protecting the protesters, so there was always gunfires, there was always conflict. Uh, millions of shots have been shot towards this building. The main first aid site is inside a power station that the protesters took over. On the walls, they count the days spent here, and they post the names of the doctors killed during the crackdown. The pharmacy stock is kept next to the fuses. There's no space left empty. Both doctors drop off their medicine, but more is still needed. So these are the hot items or the missings. So we're trying to donate some of it. We just uh, brought some. And now I just spread the words for my friends who are pharmacists so they can help us uh, bring some today and uh, the days after. Before leaving, Salma wants to check out the number of protesters. The sit-in still draws thousands of people every day, and she's proud to have contributed to the movement. That's the overwhelming feeling, being proud of being Sudanese first, being proud to be a woman, because Sudan has always been a leading country since the 50s, since the 60s, before this 30 years regime that led us all the way back and behind everybody else. So I hope by the end of uh, this revolution, by the end of this regime, uh, we'll be somewhere that we all hope to be. We'll be prosper, we'll be free, just and equal. Dreams of change are shared by those from all walks of life here. They hope to turn the page of a military dictatorship and to be able to write a new chapter in their history. Well, that report by Bastien Henri, Elodie Cousin and Julia Steers, who joins me now from uh, Cartoon. Uh, Julia, we saw a lot of scenes of jubilation uh, during these protests, but that's only part of the story. There was also violence in the early stages. Certainly, before Bashir fell and the protesters were out there for months experiencing an extreme level of violence and overuse of force on the part of the security forces who were shooting with live ammunition, they imprisoned hundreds, if not thousands, of protesters. And we can hear now from one of the doctors featured in the piece about just how intense that level of violence was. 
Definitely a gunshot to the chest for me is to kill. Like m most of the injuries were aimed at, at, at the vital places, places if you shoot someone at, it definitely lead to him dying. So I think most of them were aimed to kill. Well, also in the early stages of the protest, Julia, we saw these kind of uh, militia groups out defending Bashir. What's become of them? Certainly, Bashir really worked particularly hard at developing the security forces and also developing separate and deeply entrenched parts of the security forces. So those included the NISS. Uh, that's the intelligence agency that is still uh, out there in Khartoum and elsewhere in the country. Uh, and the RSF, that's the Rapid Support Forces, which are still deployed in the streets of Khartoum as well. And some of the leaders of those agencies are actually sitting on the Military Transitional Council that for now is is leading the country. That said, there's an extremely different tone on the streets uh, than there was from the security forces during the protests before Bashir fell. So the army is out there. This RSF paramilitary group is indeed still out there. They're heavily armed. Uh, but for now, they're allowing the sit-in to continue to take place. And they're not uh, using the level of force or really any force against the protesters for the time being. Comparisons have obviously been made with the Arab Spring. What can the protesters do to make sure this doesn't turn into a repeat of Egypt, for example? Certainly, the protesters are keenly aware of that possibility, particularly because it's the military that is still in control at the moment, and also because this is a country that has a huge faction of Islamists who would like to uh, be at the seat of power as well. So that's one of the reasons that they're remaining in the streets throughout these negotiations. They don't want it to turn into sort of endless negotiations with the military, during which time the military is able to consolidate power and to remain in power, as we've seen uh, in other countries in the region. So that's why they've said that even though Bashir has fallen, it's important for them to continue protesting, to continue to stay at the sit-in in front of the military headquarters in order to force them to hand over power to a civilian-led government. Julia Steers in Khartoum, thanks ever so much for joining us. Thank you for watching this episode of Reporters. Do join us again soon.